Welcome along everyone to the lovely second home um, and this uh, web summit kind of wind down. It's very chilled, it's very good. Um, and uh, thank you very much to Andela for putting on this night for us um, where we've been at uh, web summit for, whoop, web summit for the whole three days, uh, speaking to a lot of people about remote hiring. Uh, We've been producing a documentary uh, which is going to be called uh, Rapidly Scaling, Rapidly Hiring. Um, we've been in interviewing people for the whole of Web Summit. Uh, got some amazing interviews and uh, amazing insights from everyone. Obviously, very of the moment with uh, COVID happening and everything. And we're topping off the whole of Web Summit with this panel event, uh, Rapidly Scaling, Rapidly Hiring. Um, very pleased to introduce our panel. We have. Courtney from uh, Andela, Courtney Machi, Ben Taylor from Intergyro, Tamar, who it joins us from Molly, <laughs> very popular, and Wilfred uh, from Audio Mob. Thank you very much, guys. So, uh, yeah, without further ado, we'll just uh, get into the questions. So, I guess, for, first of all, we'll, we'll get everyone to give a little overview of their business and what's happening and particularly around the areas of like your team and your distribution of your team as well. Um, so yeah, Ben, do you want to take it away? Sure thing. Testing. Um, yeah, so we're into Gyro. We're a Swedish fintech uh, and we're on a mission to build the financial toolkit uh, for businesses to A, uh, manage all of their finances online and B, to be able to build financial services into their products to serve their end users. Um, we currently have 140 employees um, and we are distributed first, um, but we do have some physical offices uh, in, in key territories. Courtney. All right. Um, I am the VP of product at Andela. We are a global talent marketplace. So our mission is to connect brilliance with opportunity. So we have uh, technology professionals in over 80 countries in our talent network uh, that we staff with clients. And we are fully remote, so we have no office anywhere. Um, I started working at Andela about a year and a half ago, right in the very beginning of the pandemic. And when I started, or when I accepted the offer, we actually did have some physical offices. And when the pandemic began, we decided let's try remote, and we've never gone back. So now we are fully distributed, 80 countries. Yeah, so hi everyone, my name is uh, Tamar. I'm a tech TA lead at, uh, at Molly. We're a Dutch FinTech based in, uh, based in Amsterdam, uh, and we're on a mission to become the most loved PSP of Europe. Um, at the moment, we have around 550 mollies working for us, and in total a workforce of around 680, including also, uh, also contractors. Uh, we are spread out over eight offices across Europe. Uh, only this year already we launched two offices, one in uh, Maastricht. Uh, for the people who don't know the Netherlands, it's uh, somewhere south. <laughs> and uh, we quite recently also opened an office here in, uh, in Lisbon, which is specifically uh, going to be a tech hub, which we're going to grow very quickly as well. Um, so, um, yeah, from the 1st of January onwards, if kind of like the rules allow it, uh, we will move to a hybrid working model uh, where we, um, yeah, spend several days in the office as well as uh, kind of like several days uh, working, uh, working from home. Thank you. Um, so, I'm Wilfred Obeng. I'm co-founder and CTO at AudioMob. What we specialize in, and I guess our mission statement, is bridging audio and mobile opportunities. But the niche we're tackling right now is... Um, using audio ads in gaming. So if anyone's ever been annoyed by uh, those video ads that if you play Candy Crush, that's what we're trying to destroy and get rid of. Um, so that's, our, that's our, our, our mission, to allow the game developers to monetize, but also users to not be um, uh, disrupted while they play the games, and also to use less actual data, because we, we're clearly seeing there's a, a big pushback on using hyper-targeted information. Um, we're currently around, um, we're very lean actually, we're like 15 uh, employees, but we are about to double in size. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we triple <laughs> in size in, in, a, in a couple months. Um, yeah, that's a bit about us. 
Hello. Um, so, Wilfred, uh, and your, your journey, you're like, uh, at the beginning of your scaling journey, uh, how are you approaching remote work and your distribution of your team? Ask a question. I'm, I think we had a, we all had a really interesting conversation about this. Um, so what we're seeing with uh, remote work, so just for a bit of context, we started the company two years ago, and I think we were at the Google for Startups campus in London. Three months in, then, uh, then COVID lockdown happened in London. So we went from having an office space um, uh, free of charge from Google to literally doing everything remotely. So a lot of everything just became me on engineering calls with the team uh, very rapidly, and also hiring a bunch of people um, without ever meeting them, also talking to investors without ever meeting them till this day, which is really interesting. Um, and so for us, the journey has been around navigating first being completely remote, and then now, I think we're all talking about this, like the, the employees, now everything's opened up, especially our sales teams, um, being really interested in getting back into the workplace. Um, some of our engineers are a bit more like, well, I like my free you know, monitor setup, and I, you're, never, you're not going to detach me from that. Um, but they still understand, to be fair, on, even on the engineering side, the, the benefits of doing whiteboarding sessions and stuff. So we're definitely seeing the starting of a um, hybrid model. And we still actually have office space in, in London, and we also open an office in Abu Dhabi as well. Um, and then looking to also expand into America. So we are still looking out actually at having that hybrid model um, long term. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and Tamar, um, I was on your website earlier and saw you have 107 open vacancies at the moment. I mean, how many of those are remote and how are you managing that in the current environment? Um, we don't have remote um, vacancies at the moment, so we only hire people uh, based in locations where we have uh, offices. Uh, it's a huge kind of like growth what we are experiencing currently. I joined Molly myself around 15 months ago. Uh, back then we were still with around 200 people. Uh, and as mentioned at the moment, we are around like between six, 700. Uh, so um, yeah, we really noticed during COVID, because obviously everyone was working from home uh, uh, during that time, that people really miss kind of like those interpersonal connections with other, uh, other people. So we did a survey also amongst all of our uh, employees, and the majority of the people really wanted to move to a hybrid model. So this is also the reason why we chose for this model. Um, at home, you can have like focus time and be very kind of like productive and efficient. Uh, but in order to yeah, brainstorm and get kind of like creative ideas, it's really important to meet person, yeah, people in person uh, and also to build those relationships within the company. Uh, so eventually, that is the reason kind of like why we moved to this, uh, this model. We're hiring globally, but we eventually ask people to relocate uh, to the uh, locations where we have uh, offices in. That's interesting. It's something that we, we've seen as well, where because you can have remote workers for an initial period, maybe that gives you a little bit of like um, time to test someone out where they don't have to relocate, and then eventually they can move. So that's, uh, is that the approach that you're taking with, with people? We actually relocate them already because they need to be in uh, uh, the countries where we have uh, entities in, but then they wor start working remotely. Um, what we do is... Uh, because, for example, last month we onboarded 60 new mollies. Uh, so that's a huge kind of like amount of people uh, onboarding online, uh, which is also a challenge, right? Because how are you going to establish those interpersonal connections uh, in, the, in the teams eventually? Uh, so we have different tooling that we're using, uh, using for that as well. Uh, but as mentioned, kind of like when the rules allow it uh, to get into the office again, uh, we will have everyone uh, back into the office. And um, yeah, we actually moved to a new office space in Amsterdam as well during the pandemic. Uh, so we didn't really think about kind of like how we wanted to design the whole office space. Uh, and at the moment, our meeting rooms are not really soundproof. Uh, so, we're <laughs> so we're really going to uh, redesign our whole office space to uh, also enforce kind of like people to cross collaborate and have these kind of like creative meetings with each other. Great, thank you. Uh, Courtney, uh, so y you guys are like helping people with their remote teams and remote hiring. And what are the kind of challenges that you're seeing day to day with people at the, m at the moment and how they're tackling their remote hiring? With clients? Yeah. Uh, w 
you guys are fully remote, but you're also helping a lot of people with their remote teams. So are there things that come up all the time that you're helping people with? Yeah, well, we, we specialize in, in helping people hire remotely. And, um, you know, we see a lot of challenges across hiring engineers, product managers, designers, like a lot of commonalities in the way that people are looking to screen. Like it's, it's difficult to actually figure out how to assess talent to begin with. Um, and especially with product teams, um, we're starting to do more and more of that. It's, it's very, you know, PMs have a lot of different types of profiles. They come from different backgrounds. And so we are able to take a very consultative approach where we can help people kind of understand, you know, based on where the company is and its growth, the stage of the company, the, what they're actually trying to build. We can partner and help them understand kind of what the right profile of person looks like. And it's not just about, you know, somebody's skills, like, Java developer. It's it's really about we were talking earlier about EQ and how important it is and it's really about like how the team works together. Um, you you have to find that fit, right? And it's the same thing when you're hiring for your core team. Like that's the thing that matters the most. Like is this person going to vibe with the team? And so we really focus a lot on that because we find that that's, you know, remote or hybrid or whatever the model is. That's like one of the best predictors of longevity of a relationship. It's like, is this person a match? Not just can they do the job, do they have the skills, but are they going to actually be able to meld into the team? And we are, you know, we, everybody in our network is a contractor, but our goal is to make it feel like they're not. Like that's really what we're trying to do. And um, so we, we focus a lot on that. And um, we find that when we can actually, you know, deliver that, the relationships last longer. Our average length of our, one of our engagements is 18 months. So, And how do you manage the actual interview process? Do you have a very staged approach and a very systematic way of tackling it? And is it always the same or does it change from role to role? We do. Um, so currently we, we mostly do engineers, but we also um, match product managers and designers, data analysts. We're starting to expand more and more. So we do have a kind of set methodology. Um, of course, it varies based on skills, based on stacks. Um, but we also were able to customize based on what the client really needs as well. So we, we kind of are able to tweak um, based on the types of, you know, what kind of opportunities can you offer to this person longer term? Like, let's take somebody's career goals into account as well. Like, we really are focused on the long-term relationship. So it's... Definitely, we've got kind of a system in place, but we're able to tweak it and customize it based on what somebody needs. So we're really, really focused on the long-term relationship. Great, fantastic. And um, Ben, I know you guys have a few different remote teams, um, you know, in different locations, providing different services. Like, how do you manage that? And can you give us a bit of a picture of the different teams and where they are and what they're doing? Yeah, sure. So um, our product team is split across all of the territories we operate in. Um, so we have uh, product managers in Sweden, uh, based here in Lisbon, um, and also some in, in Poland and Belarus. Um, with our engineering teams, they're predominantly based in, in Eastern Europe. Um, we do have one team in Sweden. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a challenge of managing those different cultures and getting people to work together um, especially where the vast majority of people within the business have never met each other face to face. Um, and with COVID, that was particularly difficult in not being able to have the big sort of company get togethers um, to be able to create that rapport. Um, so that's something we're looking to change next year. Did you have to recreate those kind of things digitally and put some things in place? Yeah, we, we did try that. Um, there's lots of tools you can use to do that. And, um, you know, and we do lots of um, we focus on trying to find really good communication tools and collaboration tools. Um, but, but yeah, it's ultimately that human touch, that face-to-face -face relationship um, is quite hard to um, replace with, with virtual tools. Hello. Um, <laughs> what about the mix of, uh, of, of physical and remote? Um, have you found any challenges with the difference and interactions with teams and that 
potentially causing friction if some people are remote and some people are physical? Yeah, um, the, so we surveyed our, our team um, in, in the offices where there's the option to have both the hybrid option, where there is a physical office and where um, uh, people are working remotely. And 90% of our employees said that they wanted to have the hybrid. Uh, only 10% said that they wanted to, to have pure physical office. Um, uh, so I mean, all of our employees are set up so they can work fully remotely. Um, so that is sort of the common denominator. Um, and that's, that's what we default to with, with all, the, all of our organization. And do you have um, like particular process for hiring? Uh, do you have some staged, you know, how do you, how do you gauge that personal reaction or, and personal interaction when you're going through the hiring process remotely through a video call? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a massive challenge and it's, I think it's one of the biggest challenges, I think, of, uh, of remote or distributed businesses. Uh, we have a, a strict formula that we can stick to um, and we probably have more rounds than you would if it was a face-to-face -face process. Um, we have rounds that are dedicated to trying to identify certain things. So the first round will be focused on culture, trying to spot any signs of ego or cultural differences that might not work with the wider team um, before then moving on to more technical interviews um, that follow on. Great. Um, and uh, Courtney, in your kind of experience, what are, what are the like core advantages of kind of taking your hiring process kind of to the global level? What, what have we got to gain from that? Well, it's, it's great. <laughs> I, I have um, on my team, I've got people in Argentina, Brazil, Russia, US, UK, Nigeria, Kenya, like all over the place. And um, the perspective you get is just, it's, you know, everyone's got different skills, of course, but also very different experiences that they can bring to the table. And in the past, um, it would have been very difficult to assemble a group of people together like that. But now it's like on a daily basis, I, I talk to people you know, in 10 different countries and it's just, it's really interesting, especially um, building a product team. And we're a global company, we're 80 countries. Um, it's important that we have that perspective and that we, we have access to that perspective. And so, um, you know, it's, it's just become so easy now to, to find people in different countries and um, you know, there are some cultural, you know, you have to kind of make the effort to understand somebody's culture. And I think that's, that's part of the culture of Andela is like, we understand, we seek to understand, we want to understand other cultures. And, you know, once you do that and you kind of learn to form and like meld together as that team, it's just, it's really interesting to see the perspectives start to come together. And it, it influences the user experiences that we build and the products that we build in a way that, we can connect with, with people globally, so. Great, thank you. Um, so Tamar, um, before the pandemic, remote working and hybrid, hybrid work models were kind of the exception and not really the norm. Like, what advice would you give to a fast scaling company kind of looking to kind of make the shift to a kind of more global approach to hiring? How can they, how can they do that? Yeah, that's super interesting, yeah, because I, used to work for uh, international companies who always kind of like had a global uh, approach to hiring. Uh, but now there's a shift that more companies are taking this approach, right? With a remote and hybrid uh, working model. Uh, so it's a lot of opportunity to tap into talent that wasn't really available before that. And also people from disadvantaged groups, right? So I want to kind of like welcome companies as well to see how they can engage with those with that talent and give them a possibility also to work for top tech companies. You have already some companies, for example, specifically in, uh, in engineering that um, yeah, developed code academies to help uh, people uh, coding. So I also want to welcome other companies to think of kind of like schooling or open universities to really tap into that market because these people in yeah, disadvantaged regions in the world might be uh, the next tech leaders of your, uh, of your company as well. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, I would welcome companies to uh, focus on that. Excellent, thank you. Um, and so, Wilfred, 
What about um, how you guys are approaching your new hires at the moment? Like, where are you looking and how are you doing that? What kind of platforms are you using? What kind of tools are you using to, like, find new talent? Um, I think it's a mix with, as with everything, it's a mix of gathering, well, searching for talent in different ways. So we've hired first like a, a recruiter internally into our into our company who actually understands that lives our company. Because that's one thing which is we've noticed, like when you go to recruitment firms outside, they don't understand exactly how the company culture is. So the first thing um, Candice on our, our team did was she actually went through and interviewed everyone on the team and asked them, what does your actual job mean? What did you actually do? What is the team culture? What would you describe as the team culture? And I think when I saw her doing that, I, that, that was when I was like, okay, she was definitely the best person to actually um, hire for, that, for actually recruitment because I've never seen any, to be honest, um, outside and um, uh, contractual firm, especially in the UK, do that, where they actually go into that finer detail of understanding your company before then making decisions. So I think that's the first thing we did. The next thing we did is we then set out like a, a multiple, like multifaceted approach around, there's one to people who will actually hire and come to your website, but it's also actually looking for companies that are similar to yourselves that people might be interested in moving. So we had multiple different strategies in terms of finding the talent. And um, then it's using stuff like the social media platforms, like you know the LinkedIn's of the world. Um, but as, as a lot of everyone probably on this panel knows, is that a lot of the best talent you're looking for aren't really on the market, are they? So um, you, have to go, you have to go searching for them. So, so that's a lot of what we're, what we're doing right now. And then I think the other thing that's really important that we were really touching on is, is press as well around, and when I say press, it doesn't necessarily mean like how you've sent out this information to a particular publication, or it's more around even simple things like the, the power of like a life at Google channel. When I was like, well, I used to be at Google, and the power of people seeing themselves in the company, and that's something we've also been looking at around like rebranding our careers page, and then also looking at how we can actually show the stories of the people at the company, because people actually care about who they will be working with, not necessarily all of the other perks, um, especially in in the remote working world. And um, so, Tamar, uh, what kind of things are you doing and have done over the course of the last couple of years to keep company culture going, to keep uh, the feeling of people belonging to an organization even though they're having to work remotely? Yeah, that's a super interesting uh, question and I don't think there's a solution uh, for it yet. Um, we pride ourselves uh, at Molly to have a very unique culture. Uh, I worked in a lot of international companies and I totally agree kind of like with um, what you also just said around kind of like not hiring egos. Uh, we have three values, uh, be bold, be loved, be authentic. Uh, and these are super dear to us. So we indeed like uh, what you also mentioned around kind of like process. We do that in our assessment to really assess people on that uh, as well. Uh, and as mentioned before, uh, the first kind of like reason why people are joining a company is not... is uh, mission is important, right? But most of the time people join a company because of the people they're working with. Uh, so again, kind of like these interpersonal relations are even more important as well working remotely eventually. And that is also kind of like the way how you kind of like develop the culture and keep the culture. Uh, so we use various different toolings as well in order to kind of like create or manage these interpersonal relations during the pandemic. So, for example, during our onboarding program, we had a uh, tool called Mebo. I don't know if anyone heard of it, but it's kind of like a virtual world where you can walk around and have kind of like informal conversations with people. Uh, oh, Mebo, sorry. <laughs> um, um, informal conversations uh, with people uh, and where you can build those uh, interpersonal relationships. And I think those things are super important, kind of like to keep the culture and also maintain the culture whilst working uh, remotely eventually. Great, thank you. And uh, Courtney, do you guys do anything like that? Do you have any like rat, like coffee, I know what's, uh, what, what's it called, the um, water cooler moments that you kind of create digitally and things like that? Yeah, I mean, we use Slack, and but it, it's not enough to just spin up Slack and say, okay, go fully remote. Like it's, it's, <laughs> there's a lot more involved than that. 
And specifically on this, we, um, we started doing, it's like a speed dating thing, but it's not dating. Um, it's <laughs> like you, you kind of get everyone, um, there's an app where you get everyone together and it randomly pairs you with someone for 10 minutes and it gives you a topic to talk about. So it's one of the topics um, that I really liked, it's like what was you know, your favorite like childhood foods and candies and I was paired with someone from the UK. So, you know, they were talking about like things that I had never heard of. They were, I, <laughs> I was talking about things that they had never, I was talking about like the candy cigarettes. It's like, that was so weird. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's like, you would never talk about these things with, you know, your colleague. Um, so you really have to create the space for that and just kind of, you know, let people know, like we gotta let our guards down. Like it's okay. Like you're here during the day and it's not just all about work. Like, let's, you know, have a little bit of fun too. So we do, we do really make an effort to create that space and it can be exhausting. We were talking about Zoom fatigue earlier. Yeah. So like you have to be very um, conscious of that as well. Like people are on calls all day, so you can't do those things too often. And it has to be something that the team is like really engaged in and, and feels ready for. So um, yeah, there are a lot of things out there now that, uh, facilitate that. Great, thank you. And uh, Ben, do you have any any ways of injecting randomness into people's lives at work? Randomness. Um, <laughs> we're a very structured business, and absolutely not. But uh, uh, <laughs> we, when when people join, um, we we introduce them to the business on on a Slack channel, but um, ask them all to post a, a picture of them as, as a baby and to list uh, things about them that you wouldn't expect to, to know. And, and I think it's really important in terms of them having a warm welcome and, and being able to see the personalities behind the roles that you've recruited. And what about any really big mistakes you've made along the way uh, as you've been like rapidly scaling in terms of like hires and things that you've really got wrong? Uh, I mentioned earlier on about the, the importance of screening for, for ego and we've had a few examples of where we've got that really, really wrong uh, and the fallout from that impacts not just on the, the individual who has that problem but on the wider team around them uh, and so that's why now we have a much more stringent process um, for trying to identify those issues. Great. What about you, Courtney? Any big big errors? that? Uh... Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I think... You know, one of the things that I do now is I, I make time in interviews to talk about remote and what, I was like, so, you know, what would your life look like in a remote setup? Like, just try to get an idea of what somebody's life looks like because I've hired people who didn't really know what they were getting into and then they don't like it and they quit after two months or whatever because they're like, I don't, I don't want this, like, I, you know, struggle with structure in my day or like I need to go into the office and see people I feel isolated so I actually talk it through with them like here's what my day looks like and here's how I create my structure and you know here's what some of my colleagues and your future colleagues do and um, how does that sound to you so just having like a straight up real conversation about it because when you're fully remote like that stuff matters right it, it kind of becomes it's on you then to figure out how to how to structure that and how to make sure that you have that line between work and personal. Like I, you know, I always make sure I have, even if it's like a corner in, in my bedroom, I have a little dedicated workspace that feels kind of different from everything else in the house. Um, that was really hard during the pandemic, right? We were all struggling with that. So um, yeah, just, just making sure people know what they're getting into and they've like kind of played that scenario out in their minds before they accept the offer. Great. And Tamar, what, yeah. what have you learned from, from yeah. the mistakes of... Yeah, oh, it's, so, it's just like, it's so challenging, right? Because uh, at some point you need to scale the organization whilst the fun fundamentals are not in place. So you need to kind of like make, create priorities and make priorities in order to uh, yeah, keep continue to hire and at the same time build in scalable processes, right? And then doing this remotely is just like super challenging. So... The biggest learning, I think, is around kind of like communication. Uh, it's to candidates and also expectations, but also very much internally because um, 
as you maybe know, Wilfred, uh, a lot of engineers are super opinionated. And uh, a, pe a person can only kind of like handle a certain amount of change, right? Uh, and if it comes from multiple direction in their teams, but also they need to get involved in hiring and they need to set up process, it's just like too much at some point, right? Uh, and when you don't communicate clearly all the time the different steps that you're doing, they get very confused. And uh, you have like a process that's not really working and uh, hire different, yeah, the wrong people eventually. Uh, so it's super important to get that communication uh, uh, right and that you do that quite often as well. Uh, written, but also uh, verbal in all hands what we are uh, uh, giving every two weeks. Uh, and at some point, uh, we reached the point that we uh, over-communicated. So that people said, like, we heard this already. And I was like, okay, <laughs> goal achieved. <laughs> yeah. What about you guys, Wilfred? Uh, any big, big mistakes that, you, that have kind of changed processes and things for you guys already? Yeah, I think if you haven't made mistakes, then you're not learning, right? So I think um, to... to to, to, to Mark's point, because we were talking about this earlier, I think the number one thing for me is communication. Because you kind of, you go in a trap of, um, as I said, we went from having an office and then three months later having completely remote. So one of the things that definitely got lost in translation is using Slack as the, the primary mode of um, communication. Because tone is completely lost um, on, on people. So sometimes they take it like, oh, this person's in a, in a bad mood or they're quite blunt or quite direct, but they could literally have been rushing to a meeting, trying to merge like a, a piece of code together, and then and then they've um, they've just just quickly tried to type something, and then in that moment, someone's misconstrued it. So I think what we've noticed is that, as, as Tamar was saying, as you were just saying earlier, is um, we had to also make sure we had enough meetings where people could, like engineering syncs. So we basically, we, we, we modified the scrum methodology quite a bit to be honest um, I don't, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of following traditions um, so so we, we we modified it quite a bit so we have like two bulk engineering things that are an hour long and it's actually for each pod that actually goes through their different pieces and it gives them a chance to actually talk to one another and actually say what the issues are rather than a quick 15 minute scrum and it actually almost brings people together in that kind of sinking moment um, so the communications of the day don't kind of seem like one-off or fluttering um, or fleeting. Um, so yeah, that's, that's another thing we did. So we made, I, that was very clear to me that after a few, as you said, a uh, piece of feedback from uh, different people on the team, <laughs> that um, we needed to make sure that there was enough of those um, creating those moments. And I think the other thing we, I, I've, I've definitely learned um, during the hybrid model is also learning to accommodate people's different needs and also mental health. Um, and so. So we, we very quickly started offering like a mental health service to the team just to make sure, because people obviously had other personal things going on as well and it doesn't help them being cooped up in a, in a, in a room and, and, and um, to what Courtney said, not being sometimes able to break from what work is and what your, your issues are. So that's a, another um, service that we, we became very clear that we, we definitely should be offering um, even at our, our, that size, the size we were um, initially. Excellent. Thanks, everyone. I wanted to open up uh, the floor to any questions for anyone the, who might have something for the panel. Mike? I, I struggled during the pandemic with hiring new people coming into an established organisation of 100 people and not feeling like they weren't part of the, the group, part of the team. And I don't think we ever cracked that, and we've given up our office as well, so there's no... All we can do now is have you know, the weighing days or fun days or whatever they're going to be. We're never going to recreate the, the kind of cohesion that we had around the water cooler and going for drinks after work. And that's gone. How do, we, how do we, are there any tips? How is that going to come back? Or do we just have to accept that's the old way and it's not coming back? I can, I, can, I can start, I guess. So one thing we did um, around that, because I guess we have both sides, like the advertising and gaming side, we, we, we had socials that we then had to convert into online socials. But so what we did is we used games like Among Us, um, and there's also, there's also um, I think Troy will kill me, I can't remember the actual... Uh, it's, a, it's like some jukebox game. Basically, you have to do like Pictionary and, and all sorts of other games, like online Monopoly and stuff like that. But you do it as a team. And what we found actually is that actually was very helpful. On, on, so we did that every Friday. 
and it, it was obviously, ob obviously optional, but we actually found most of the team would come because it was actually that moment in time they would drink a beer virtually if they wanted to, and then they would be playing these, like, these online games. And that was actually a way of breaking those, uh, to your point, around people not feeling part of the team. And people then realizing, oh, someone like told this kind of joke. That means they, they're probably interested in this, and I'll, I'll do a side message and talk to them about that. And that kind of started feeding into people, then building those natural, which we do very easily in office, to be honest with you, um, but do, doing those things using stuff like Slack and then also um, reaching out to one another. Yeah, I really like that idea. Yeah, we did also a lot of um, online social uh, social events as well, so as part of the onboarding. And as I, well, I just mentioned, the, the Mebo uh, app was really helpful as well. Uh, but online wine tasting, uh, we even wrote kind of like poems in order to introduce them to the teams. Uh, I think what's also super important is to um, have a mentor in the organization uh, that can guide you kind of like through the through the organization and get, can get you in touch with like other uh, other people, also cross-functional teams, right? Because you don't want to have that belonging with one team, but with the wider company as well. Uh, so introduce them to like different parts of the organization, let them know kind of like what they're doing and what they're working on. Uh, during the onboarding time as well, which is super important to create kind of like that uh, feeling of belonging uh, to a company. Yeah, all of those things are great. We also have, um, so obviously during the pandemic we couldn't really do this, but now that things have started to open up, we've started to set some dates for meetups. And you kind of like, you're, you're working with someone for so long on Zoom and you just see them in the little box. You're like, oh, I'm gonna meet them in three months. Like, this is super exciting. So it kind of like builds the anticipation and the excitement. And then you finally meet someone, you're like, oh, this is what they're like. And like, it's just, it's very exhilarating and thrilling. And like that energy of the week or whatever kind of sustains you in a way, like until the next one. So I've worked, you know, in fully remote companies for five years now. And this is kind of how we've managed it. I really think that the whole kind of like, you call it corporate or whatever, these group kind of meetups, it's gonna become a huge thing over the next couple of years. Like there's a lot of business in that. Um, people who can figure out how to scale it and do it well because that's kind of what sustains us in terms of like needing that, you know, social interaction. But we also do all the other things that uh, Wilfred and Tamar are talking about. Couldn't agree more. Um, that was the biggest problem for us with uh, the pandemic, is that we had grand plans for doing big company meetups so people could have those face-to-face -face meetings um, and those relationships would then sustain until the next time they were able to have a meetup. Um, I think there's, there are things that we've tried to do, um, having uh, a strong culture and, and having strong values and having things like Values Month where we ask people to nominate people for certain values and to celebrate that within the business can help to, to encourage that kind of um, personal relationships even if you're not meeting up face to face. Thank you. Any, uh, any more questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so for your engineers, has being remote been very much different? Because you know, as you guys talk, I'm thinking, well, when I was in the office, I would write Slack messages to the person next to me. <laughs> <laughs> so it really didn't feel any different, you know? So I'm just curious if there's a difference between different like, uh, parts of your companies. I'll just uh, very quickly summarize the question. So uh, just for the, for the recording. Um, so you're, you're asking if there's been a, a big change from people working within the office using the tools that they're using like Slack um, and actually then going remote and specifically for engineers, has that changed a great deal uh, with, uh, with the pandemic? And a key bit of feedback we've had from specifically from engineers is um, Zoom fatigue and it being um, because of not being in, in able to have meetups or working in the same space, they're forced to, to be on more Zoom calls than they would before. And perhaps then they're not the personalities that quite like being in that environment. Um, and so for us, it's absolutely cool if, if you don't like that to turn off your camera. Um, there's no problem with that. But, um, but yeah, it's, uh, that, that's the main feedback we've had on that. I feel like for us, actually, it's engineers have really positive feedback because they can kind of code anytime now and there's no expectation to be in a chair 
in a place between eight and five or whatever the hours are. Um, so yeah, there's just, there's so much more flexibility. Uh, you can like grab your laptop and go to Portugal <laughs> and to the south of Portugal and just code on a beach if you want. So um, yeah, it. But the Zoom fatigue is real. So there's you got to have the flexibility there. Yeah, I do recognize what you're uh, what you're saying. Uh, <laughs> But for us, moving back into the office um, would rethink also the way how you use your office time, right? So indeed, like for engineers, they like to go, but we expect them to do that then during the days that they are at home. Uh, but they also need to design systems. They need to architect new uh, pieces of, uh, of tech. Uh, and it's super creative as well, right? So we expect them to really think, okay, the time in the office, am I really going to use that to select the person next to me? Or am I going to sit with like product managers uh, or other people in the organization to exchange ideas and to come to creative solutions in the end? Uh, so I think that is the shift that companies need to make if they are moving back to a hybrid model instead of indeed kind of like using Slack to message the person who is uh, who is sitting next to you. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I I agree with I think everything that's been said, but I think the one thing I've noticed is. Uh, the first thing is, to, to your point around uh, engineers, yes, there is a difference between how, um, when I'm talking to engineering teams versus the, even the words that are being used by the sales team around um, wanting to like see and feel and understand more around other people. Whereas a lot of the, um, like some of the engineering team want to use it more for like whiteboarding sessions, but they're very happy with their setups at home. Like I want my free, I really want free screens. Like being on a laptop isn't like in in the office is great. Like getting to know everyone, but they feel less productive um, on in in terms of that point. Um, so yeah, I I I hear I hear what you're saying, and we definitely had that feedback. Um, the other thing with engineering that I've noticed as well is um, to your point around overuse of meetings. Um, we actually have. As I said, we're not following the, like, the full Scrum methodology, so a lot of our, our team actually voted to not have as many meetings, so to not do the morning stand-ups, because they felt it was actually a waste of time, and to actually just have two syncs and then two 15-minute um, two syncs a week and have two one-hour meetings. Actually, no, one one-hour meeting now, because they actually decided to destroy that with the take of meeting now, because they, they just really just want to just code and focus on the task and use those blocks to then sync. So I think getting that feedback to your point around uh, from the engineering team is it's a lot more focused on getting the work done and being in less meetings, but then using the channels and those other means to clear up the more of the social issues. Whereas on the sales side, I can see it's all about relationship building, connections um, on, on, on their side as well. Great. Uh, so we've got time for one more question. You there? Yeah. <laughs> yes, you. <laughs> So as you guys scale and have to manage all these team members, what are you using to kind of check in with them or see like employee satisfaction, especially from a remote standpoint? So the, uh, the question is around uh, how are you measuring uh, satisfaction levels within your staff um, with, with remote working? How are you gauging how people are going? So I think uh, there's a number of things. I guess the engineering always goes to data-driven stuff, but then there's then I will actually also, which is just as important, the human touch, right? So the first thing is doing like the surveys. I think everyone's mentioned to understand what people's sentiment is. But then I think the one thing that's really important to me is the one-to-ones. So I do all of the one-to-ones with all of the, engin all the engineers, and on the cadence that we decide, like some people want to talk two week every two weeks, some people want to talk every week, some people want to talk every month. So it's just around asking that question in those uh, sessions, because I think you get way more answers on, uh, on that one-to-one -one than you do sometimes when people don't feel as comfortable in, in, in saying certain reservations they might have or issues they, they might be experiencing, whether that's more personal. So I think, yeah, using data-driven, but then also um, having those one-to-ones where you have a bit more of the personal touch. And I think um, to what some of the everyone else has mentioned is also, yes, having those times where you also do meet um, you're using the hybrid model because then you actually get the full body language, right? Which actually tells you a lot more than what anyone else is actually saying to you. So, so I think those are also very useful, even with the engineering team as well. Yeah, I fully, uh, I fully agree. We do also kind of like a quarterly uh, EMPS, but I think the one-to-one -one meetings are more important. However, some people 
feel more confident in order to kind of like write it down than just like tell it to their manager in, uh, in person. Uh, at Molly, we also did a great place to work survey uh, during the pandemic. And what was funny, what came out of it was that people uh, value the office the most. Uh, well, we were working remotely. Uh, <laughs> so they are really happy to get back into the, into the company now. But I think it's super important to be constantly kind of like on top of uh, your employees and how satisfied they are, and specifically also during the pandemic uh, to their mental health, what you just also mentioned, uh, uh, Wilfred. Completely agree. Um, I feel like the data-driven stuff is important, but I've also seen people start to just, I don't want to call it game the system, but you know, just give a nine or a 10 every time so that you don't have to talk to someone. Like if you actually you know, feel like you might have an issue, you don't want to talk about it. Anyway, um, the one-on-ones are super important, uh, and mental health also very, very important. We've started to offer like better up to some people who feel like they might want that, which is like a coaching counseling service. Um, and we've also started to do just kind of like group share sessions, and we actually start with like a little breathing exercise and stretching exercise to like get everyone really relaxed. And um, I feel like because we've started to create some of that space, like at first everyone's like, hmm, it's a little odd, but now people have started to warm up to it and actually start to feel more comfortable sharing. And I feel like when you model that and people see that you're sharing as well and you're creating the space for it, then it just starts to organically happen. So just more of that. Yeah, it's, it feels like we're on the same page. So we, we also do EMPS forms um, on a regular basis um, and also try to empower our team leads to, to, to have one-on-one -on -one sessions with their team members to filter back any issues that they have become aware of. Um, we've recently hired um, engineering managers specifically with the role to, to try and have more one-to-one -one sessions with our engineering teams. Uh, again, just to get that feedback loop. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much uh, to our panel and uh, our audience. Um, let's give them a round of applause for their contribution. <laughs>